so good evening, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Happy New Year. Welcome to today's SEO's Cultural Economics uh, online seminar, uh, which is part of the Association for Cultural Economics International uh, Activities. I'm Elisabetta Lazzaro, this is coordinator, professor of uh, creative and cultural industries management at the Business School for the Creative Industries at the University for the Creative Arts in the UK. Today's seminar is on violence, hate, and cultural participation. And in particular, we will deal with uh, rather uh, unseen aspects of uh, cultural uh, participation in research so far, such as violence and hate, and the possible relationships uh, uh, with cultural participation. I'm so pleased to uh, present our great speakers of today, Luisa Iacian and Paul Heritage, and Daria Denti and Alessandro Crociata, who will uh, uh, discuss these topics with us uh, today. Luisa Iacian uh, has a PhD in cultural economy, in cultural econo in uh, economics, I'm sorry. And she is technical officer at the International Labour Organization in Geneva. And uh, she works uh, on advancing decent work and inclusiveness. Paul Heritage is professor of drama and performance at Queen Mary University of London and director of uh, People's Palace Project. And uh, he has uh, quite an experience in uh, projects uh, on uh, uh, cult culture and social injustice uh, in the UK, UK, Brazil, South America, India, and Pakistan. Daria Denti, economist, is assistant professor at the Gran Sasso Science Institute, L'Aquila, Italy, and visiting fellow at the London School of Economics. Alessandro Crociata is cultural economist, associate professor of applied economics and director of the Urban Cultural Observatory at the Gran Sasso Science Institute at L'Aquila, Italy. So uh, we will start with Daria and Alessandro, uh, followed by uh, Luisa and Paul. And in the second part of our seminar, we will have uh, Roma for questions, comments, uh, and answer together with you, uh, the whole audience. So please, uh, uh, Daria and uh, Alessandro, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you. I will, sorry, I will share the screen now. And I hope you can see. Yes. Okay, so, um, so the, the section of my presentation is about a recent paper that I had co-authored with Alessandro and Alessandra Fajan. Uh, that has been recently published in the Journal of Cultural Economics and is called Knocking on Earth's Door, Dismantling Hate Through Cultural Consumption. So in a nutshell, the aim of the paper is providing a measure of the effect of consuming cultural product in reducing the proliferation of hate event. So we believe that the topic is interesting for several reasons. Uh, first of all, the fact that hate implies huge socioeconomic and emotional cost, both to victim and to society. And the other things that we know is that hate has a cultural dimension. Why is this so? Because hate um, hinges on prejudices and stereotypes, and these are cultural norms that pertain the local um, cultural environment in which we all live. And we also know from previous work uh, done by others, but also by me and Professor Fajan, that hate has a strong cult uh, spatial dimension, so that there are social spatial feature that actually have a meaningful influence on hate. And this is also acknowledged by hate scholars since now they acknowledge that understanding hate simply by looking at personality trait of perpetrator doesn't really explain the geography of hate event that we are currently seeing. And this is, I think, pretty straightforward to get since, I mean, hate monger do not live in a spatial vacuum. I mean, they live in places and it's quite, I mean, straightforward to think that the characteristic of these places have some kind of, inter of influence on them. And the other thing that we know is that hate is currently growing. So here you see a Guardian headline from 2019 about a survey that has been conducted in Italy. And you see that, for instance, in Italy, 
more than half of these respondents actually said that racist acts are somehow justifiable, okay? Um, the other thing that we knew before starting this research is that there is now established evidence from randomized controlled trials, so experimental evidence, showing that when people are exposed to cultural consumption, I mean, there are measures of uh, increased tolerance in their behavior. Of course, this established evidence um, comes from um, small scale experiments. So for us, it, would, it was relevant to understand what happened when you provide this measure considering an entire country. And this is what uh, we do in the paper and we focus in the, on the case of Italy. Why we do so? Well, first of all, because Italy is experiencing growing number of eight events. So you see more or less in 10 years from 29 to 2019, hate has been growing by 31% average annual growth rates. So the numbers are super relevant. And we also know from previous studies that hate events in Italy are especially heterogeneous and also that space matter. For instance, in this work with Alessandra Fajan, we showed that um, the geography of inequality in Italy is a determinant of online hate. And then of course we can exploit um, unique database that we design in which we have um, geolocalized information of both hate event and cultural consumption for Italian province for the period between 2029 and 2018. Um, here you see a snapshot, snapshot of the data. So when it comes to hate event, we measured hate event using this database uh, collected by an NGO called Lunaria. They have mapped all the hate events that have been happening in Italy um, taking the information from NGO, from newspaper, from administrative data, and this um, alleviates the issue of underreporting of hate event because we do not only rely on hate crime reported to the police, but also to events that have been reported to NGO, to journalists, and in this, um, this allows us to alleviate uh, measurement bias. For each event, we know the information about the date and the place. Overall, we have more than 6,000 observations for the considered time period. Um, the two um, graph show you, the first graph on the top shows you the trend of eight event, and you see that they have been growing for Italy. And the map shows you only one year of the one that we consider, 2013, and you see the geography, so the heterogeneous geography of eight events across Italian provinces that are our unit of observation. When it comes to cultural consumption, our data come from this um, agency that is the Italian Society of Authors and Publishers that has been collecting data on the consumption of cultural products um, across Italian provinces since uh, 1920s for every year. Um, and we have information of cultural participation for both paid and free events. Uh, we do not cover a uh, book reading. This is an information that we not, do not have, but all the rest, theater, museums, cinema, concerts, so on and so forth, we have all the information. Here you see a plot of the descriptive evidence. Uh, on the vertical line, you see the growth rate of eight events per 100,000 inhabitants in the province. And on the horizontal axis, you see the variation in cultural consumption. And what you see is that already you see a pattern of um, negative effect. So you see that the more the province consume culture, the low the lower the growth rate of eight events. And we also see, if you focus on the true um, graph on the bottom, that this effect does not seem to be related to, uh, driven by um, the big cities like regional capitals and not even by the province in which um, we uh, experience the highest growth in refugee hosting um, in, in the considered time span, which is relevant because you can imagine, especially in Italy, that maybe refugee reception is a risk factor for hate. Uh, here you see that even if we just focus on the province in which um, hosting uh, of asylum seeker grew the most, it doesn't really change the pattern that we see. So our empirical strategy is quite wide. You can see it in the paper. I mean, it's open access, so it's really um, easy to, 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 to find and read through it. Uh, we go through two main estimation strategies. First, we look for a basic OLS, so we look for correlational measure, uh, in which we measure the measure of association between consuming cultural product and the incidence of eight event, controlling for several potential co-founding features. 
Then see, we want, we, we want to provide, try to provide measure of a causal link. We then uh, estimate an instrumental variable model in which our instrumental variable draws on the Bartik shift share literature. Basically, we construct a synthetic index of cultural consumption um, using the shift share approach. Um, so, um, okay, this is the way we measure variables. So eight is gonna be given by the log of eight events at the province level weighted by the population. And culture is the audience of cultural event, paid and free admission that we weight by the population and also by the touristic attractiveness of the province. So to deflate cultural consumption that is mainly driven by tourists, I mean, for instance, uh, Verona uh, with the lyric session, I mean, the cultural consumption there is quite likely to, mainly driven by people not living there. So we want to consider consumption of cultural progress by local population. So these are the results. Um, and I mean, the results are, I mean, pretty robust. Uh, so starting from the basic, so the OLS, we find that um, if uh, we increase cultural consumption, there is a significant and relevant decrease in the incidence of eight event in the province. Uh, and this result is corroborated when we use the instrumental variable approach, that is the second column. And also when we um, include among control, the potential effect of persistent cultural feature. So we know that we are talking about prejudice and stereotype, and we know that this, this can be slowly changing cultural norm. So we account for this, for the fact that we can have different established and persistent cultural outlook at the local level. Uh, by constructing dummy variables that reproduce the geography of pre-unitarian Italian state. Uh, we know from historical literature that pre-unitarian state uh, have been persistent in Italy and they have meaningful effect on uh, our cultural outlook, the current one. We also control for this and we see that our results are still there. So this allows us to conclude that consuming cultural product is beneficial to reduce aid, uh, and our explanation is that consuming culture challenge stereotypes and this breaks the eight building process. And this also corroborates this finding, the fact that cultural stimuli can actually change the cultural outlook of places in a relatively short time. Um, and finally, uh, policy-wise, I mean, we think that our results uh, provide further support for um, cultural supporting policy since, I mean, there's also this interesting effect in mitigating hate and intolerance. And now I stop and I leave the floor to Alessandro. Thank you. I'm trying to, okay. Alessandro, please unmute yourself. Okay, here I am. Thanks. First of all, thanks for inviting us to these seminars. Uh, I will take just a few minutes to contextualize the sharp presentation of Daria and our uh, measurement uh, estimation uh, in, a, uh, in a framework that we are um, developing in uh, GSSI that is mapping the indirect effect of cultural participation. Um, well, the main assumption uh, is that uh, culture can uh, let agents uh, to um, pro-social and proactive behavior linked to uh, socially relevant issues. So as you can see from the uh, right side of the screen, we move by looking at some European, and I can say not only European policy imperative, such as recycling waste or waste management, energy uh, saving, uh, sustainable mobility, or the issue linked to the needs. That are all relevant issues. And our main assumption is to um, questioning uh, if and how culture, uh, and namely cultural participation, could be uh, an antecedent or a driver of, of um, proactive behavior in order to solve or to cope with such 
with such issues. So um, studying literature, by looking at literature, we know that in everyday life, in everyday behavior and so in everyday choice, uh, agents or individuals are um, deeply um, linked to a sort of uh, um, bias in, uh, in, in behavior and choices that are related to a sort of automatic inf information processing or a sort of lock-in situation uh, and what some scholars call uh, frozen behaviors. And how to unlock such a situation, how to, to unfreeze such, uh, such behavior. For instance, we know that uh, it's very difficult to uh, unlock uh, non-virtuous uh, uh, behaviors in uh, recycling waste, waste or in energy saving by looking only at uh, uh, economic incentives or other uh, um, instrumental uh, determinants. Um, we believe our main uh, hypothesis is that culture can be the, the driver uh, to unlock the behavior because to unfreeze such behaviors, uh, agents need to question the established habits. And, and so we consider that uh, connatural to cultural experience is the questioning of existing convention and meanings. As to expose ourselves to uh, in a situation of cultural experience where we uh, don't know before, we can evaluate before the satisfaction of the of such experience, and um, in some way, uh, let us to be more prone to the risk, to the unconventional, and also to uh, re-question the existing convention. So um, we believe that such approach and such experience could lead to a, a sort of reframing our mental setting, our convention, uh, and so also our knowledge and belief system. Uh, and that's why we measure, uh, in, in the case of, uh, uh, of hate events, a sort of positive outcome of such experience that we already map in several other uh, policy dimensions just to um, um, share, uh, shed a light on the indirect effect of cultural participation. So we move the, the, our point of view, try not to understand how cultural participation could be beneficial in terms of uh, uh, occupation, uh, GDP, and so on, but by looking at and how culture, and namely cultural participation, could be beneficial in order to solve some other problems linked to public policy uh, and linked to everyday behavior uh, of, uh, of agents. Um, finally, such mechanisms uh, work not only at individual level, but also at social level. But as we know by looking at literature, cultural participation is a, is a form of a, um, relational good in which individuals are embedded in a social context that can reinforce such mechanism and can lead to um, a sort of uh, uh, spatial settings of uh, what we call uh, a social cognitive environment. So we are far from uh, defining a theoretical framework, we are working on it of course, but as the conceptual framework, we believe there is a room to continue such studies in order to prove how culture could be beneficial in order to solve some relevant uh, social and policy issues. Uh, that's all. Thanks. Thank you so much to Alessandro and Daria. And now the floor is of Luisa and Paul. Thank you. I think I'm starting, but I'm just the warm up act. I'm not an economist. I'm just going to say a few words to uh, to introduce the research. Um, so the research was uh, that we're going to be talking. We talked about in the article was undertaken in a complex of 16 favelas in Rio de Janeiro. I'm talking from Rio now, uh, and this complex of favelas is uh, known as Mare. If you know anything about Rio, there's over a thousand favelas in in Rio de Janeiro. 
you can pass the slides on, um, Lisa, uh, Louisa. Um, there's over a thousand favelas in Rio, each that have their own name. Um, and the, uh, the, 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 some of them are organized into these complexes. Uh, one of the things that's most distinctive about this, can I have the next slide, um, Louisa? Louisa, can you please switch to the uh, slide mode in your presentation? So this research was undertaken, which is really important to what Louisa is going to be saying, in partnership with a local um, civil society organization called Mare Networks, who are here amongst these icons here. That's great. Um, so it was set up and run for three years. Uh, most of the work, which Louisa is going to be very, talking very much, is about the way in which uh, the survey was done, how we, the sort of information we were looking for in order to answer these, the, these, these research questions. I seem to have moved to research question two. Uh, does the fear of victim, being a victim, represent a strong determinant of individuals' behavior than the actual occurrence of armed conflicts? And why are we dealing with armed conflicts? Because as whatever you know about Rio's favelas, you probably know that they're dominated by armed drug gangs. So. What is distinctive, distinctive, we can look to the next slide, Louisa, about Mare, is that the these 16 favelas are divided into three or four different groups. Louisa, can I see the map in the next slide, please? Um, we, we are trying to fix the, 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 uh, the projection mode. Uh. So <laughs> we've gone back, the context and uh, justification. So the context is the work that was done in these 16 favelas. The justification, it's interesting hearing the previous um, presentation about hate, because hate comes two ways in these favelas. One, which of course is the hate between these different armed drug gangs. The, Mare is the significantly the only place in Rio where the four gangs come close to each other. So you, it's not like a situation, I don't know what it's like in Italy, but in London of having sort of small gangs that are separate for each street. No, this is a situation where three main gangs dominate the entire city. So the thousand favelas are developed, divided between the Red Command, the Third Command, and a one of the gangs that's called the Friends of Friends and the illegal police militias. So if you look at the map here, you'll see that when we were doing the research, it was really important to us that the, the individual favelas, the 16 of them, were also marked out according to these different armed gangs. Hate, of course, between them is the context in which people live their lives. But also, I think it's important to say that hate, which as we know comes from is so intrinsically linked with fear that the hate that the residents of the favelas feel, and there's 140,000 of them in Marais, the hate that they feel is also a hate that is expressed by the city that has excluded them. So um, am I talking about proximity effect? Sorry, um, just seeing the chat come up here. Uh, the, um, the uh, so, the research was, so this is some context for the violence in Rio. In one year, there were 39 police operations. And when, they had, when we say police operations, it means the police comes in shooting and firing. 20 armed confrontations recorded between the criminal gangs, 49 deaths, and 25 closures of health facilities or, and or schools. And the reason we know these sort of figures is not because of the state, but because of Net Mare Networks, which is the research organization based in Mare that was collecting this data. So our challenge as researchers and the, the overall uh, aim of this research, funded by the UKRI, funded by the AHRC, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and the Economic and Social Sciences Research Council, was to look at the intersections between violence, mental health, the arts, and to try to understand, and poverty, and to try and understand at those intersections between those four axes, what is it that we know we can learn about how um, people participate in and consume culture. So the research was published in four 
in four separate books. Uh, one which is uh, represents the the survey, which I think um, Louise is going to be talking about, which is a survey of uh, 1,200 uh, residents and 200 users of the open crack scenes, um, because we decided to take the uh, a particular focus on the people who are openly using crack within the within the community, and also to talk about their cultural consumption, just as anyone else's. Um, so it was a, a quantitative survey, and then qualitative, with eight, we did um, focus groups, in-depth interviews, and all of these are covered in these books. And then what I was responsible for was the arts work. So when we think about the circuit of hate, and it's a, it's a very complex network of hate that operates in that community, between the drug gangs, between the drug gangs and the police, between the residents in these drug gangs that dominate their lives, between the community as a whole and the society that has rejected them and excluded them. How, we wanted to ask, how could cultural participation, cultural consumption break those networks? So while Louisa and her gang of economists and sociologists uh, were setting up their their research methodologies. I was leading research methodologies that used that worked on participatory arts methods with the local poets, the local hip hop um, communities. We were looking at choirs, and we were looking at specifically about ceramics projects. How could ceramics be a potential intervention? And so, over the course of the three years. Um, the, these are the different results that we produced in this research. But Louise is going to be talking very specifically now about the sort of things that interest you as economists and to think about uh, cultural participation and the way in which we, we constructed that survey. So, Louisa, over to you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for, for attending the seminar today. And thank you so much, especially to the organizers, for the invitation to present our paper today. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, so our paper, uh, in this context, given the context that Paul gave, um, our paper uh, has two main research questions. Uh, the first one is whether individuals' fear of violence helps explaining choices between consuming culture in private or public spaces. And the hypothesis here is that individuals who fear more violence will choose to participate more in cultural activities in private spaces as compared to public venues. Uh, so it's interesting that we are in the same session as uh, uh, Daria and Alessandro because uh, uh, it's kind of a complementary research question here. And uh, we are looking at the opposite side of the, of the relationship here. So the second research question is um, on whether the perception of violence, uh, in other words, whether it is the fear of violence that affects individual behavior uh, rather than the actual occurrence of armed conflicts. And here the, the hypothesis is that the perception will have a, a stronger impact than the actual occurrence of violence incidents. Well, the, the literature just before, uh, just before uh, moving to the, to the methods and results of our paper, uh, just a quick, uh, a quick overview on the literature. So uh, the literature on the determinants of cultural consumption, um, it mainly centers on how individual characteristics helps explaining cultural participation. So how uh, education, age, income, uh, and gender, how these individual characteristics explain individual, uh, how, how these explain uh, cultural participation. And there is very little research on territorial characteristics. And at the same time, uh, we see the association between uh, cultural participation and violence in this opposite direction. Uh, so in how um, culture helps uh, making territories safer and uh, decreasing violence in territories. Well, um, while there is no research on how um, violence restricts cultural participation 
and shapes cultural participation and behavior, uh, there's some research on how violence affects individual behavior uh, in other fields of psychology or humor, human behavior research. So for instance, there are studies on how uh, violence contributes to teacher absentees and on how violence uh, explains, for instance, uh, the choice of where individuals are going to live. Well, going uh, now moving to, to the methods of the research, we are looking specifically at watching movies and listening to music, because those are cultural activities that uh, you can find a parallel for, uh, for the activity in a private and in a public venue. So in watching movies and, and listening to music, we looked at uh, private spaces consumption, uh, both through the internet and by other means. And for instance, by watching DVDs and listening to CDs or other forms of music consumption. And uh, cultural participation in public spaces is basically uh, going to the cinema and watching uh, music in, in live concerts. So uh, when we look at the dependent variables, we are looking at the gap between the frequency of public and private spaces. And I'm sorry here, the, the light is off. <laughs> Apparently, I'm not moving enough here, but it's OK. It doesn't matter. Um, and when we, when we look at the dependent variables, uh, we are looking at the gap between the frequency of public and, and private spaces, uh, which basically measures the propensity that an individual has to consume uh, to consume either movie or music in a public space. So this is the this is the dependent variable. So those are the four dependent variables that we have actually. And uh, as Paul explained, this is uh, this is based on a survey that was conducted in the context of the Building Barricades research, uh, which is a, a, an interdisciplinary research project. And then in the context of this project, uh, we conducted this survey with 1,211 uh, adults representative of the whole population of Marea. And um, so this survey is um, basically with 1% of the whole population, uh, which is of 140,000 inhabitants. And um, we looked at uh, two main variables as explanatory variables, which are the fear of being hit by a stray bullet. We, we found out that the fear of being hit of a, uh, by a stray bullet is one of the strongest fears that people face in Rio de Janeiro. That's why we chose this variable. And we also looked at the actual occurrence of violence events. So the actual occurrence of incidents of, of armed conflicts. And uh, we had control variables, uh, education, age, gender, household income, unemployment, internet quality, access to culture in the childhood, and also control variables for each of the 16 slums uh, in order to control for any specificities of each of the slums, such as the supply of cultural facilities. Uh, then we conducted uh, our econometric strategy was to do a simultaneous bivariate order per bit model because we were running uh, two equations at the same time and also because the dependent variables were continuous variables uh, with um, with ordered outcomes. And we reduced the sample size uh, to include only people who do consume culture. So only people who do watch movies and only people who do listen to music. Uh, so in this way, we managed to exclude those uh, who didn't have interest for culture, for instance. The results showed that fear of stray bullet negatively impacts consumption of movies in the cinema at 5% significance level as compared to watching movies in the internet and at 10% significance level as compared to other means. And also fear of stray bullet negatively impacts the consumption of live music at 5% significance level as compared to listening to music on the internet 
and at 1% significance level as compared to other means. At the same time, the actual occurrence of armed conflicts incidents only affect the gap between live music and other means. And this was significant at 10% level. So uh, we, had, uh, we had these results, which means that, uh, yes, the fear of stray bullet is a stronger predictor. And it is a predictor uh, to the uh, choice between consuming culture in private uh, rather than public spaces. And it is a stronger predictor than um, the actual occurrence of violent violence events. So consuming culture in private spaces is a, is, it can be seen as a substitute for going out, uh, especially when people fear violence. And um, these results uh, leads to some consequences for public policies. Um, um, we see that in, in Brazil, the, and in, in most of the world, actually, one of the most important uh, cultural policy is uh, increasing supply. And here in this context, we can see that increasing supply is not enough uh, to develop cultural consumption in a territory that is highly affected by violence. So here we call attention to the interaction between public policies. Um, in this context, it would be key to fight against the feeling of insecurity. And here we highlight the feeling uh, more than the actual, the actual uh, occurrence of, of violence, but the uh, fighting against the feeling of insecurity. And also, um, we, it, it could be important, for instance, to uh, develop ways of, or foster ways of, of consuming culture in private spaces. Uh, we can infer, infer here that the internet could be a particularly relevant tool uh, in a context like this. Uh, but at the same time, uh, looking at the data we have, uh, we saw that the benefits of online cultural participation actually remain concentrated in, in terms of socioeconomic groups. For instance, uh, it's mainly young people and more wealthy people uh, that consume culture online. And we also, um, we also, distinguish some avenues for future research. So future research could compare the results of our study and look at other marginalized territories in both developing and developed countries. Um, and when doing that, an ideal investigation uh, should actually rely on information of the same individuals along the time because and capturing the variations in fear and, and in violence events and how this causes variations in, in choices of cultural participation. And also future research could break down the determinants of digital cultural participation and investigate the possibilities of the internet to broaden the profile of cultural consumers. Thank you very much. I left the link Thank to the paper much. in the chat. Thank you, Luisa, and thank you, uh, Paul, for your uh, second presentation. So here uh, we have uh, um, cultural participation uh, as a cause and as effect uh, compared to uh, social behavior, negative social behavior. So in the first presentation, cultural participation uh, it has uh, uh, positive indirect, indirect effects on negative uh, social behaviors. While in the second presentation, although in a different context, in a different research design, uh, with a different methodological approach, um, uh, uh, negative social behaviors uh, do have a negative impact on uh, cultural participation. So how do we fix that? Does anybody want uh, uh, to intervene? In terms, 
<laughs> in terms of a non-economics <laughs> uh, person. One of the things I think is so instructive in all the years we've been working in these communities is obviously there is a culture of fear, there is a culture of hate, and there is a there is a culture that that attracts young people to these alternative lifestyles. And, and, and it is a, a complete lifestyle if you choose to, or if you are incorporated into these drug gangs. Um, and what is significant, I think, in the way in which the cultural activity and the cultural participation, it's all to say it, but we need to be as good as the drug gangs. I mean, the uh, one of the things that is distinctive about the pattern of behavior of activity of the of the gangs is that they operate 24 hours a day and they particularly operate at times when most of our cultural offer is not there except as louisa says in terms of digital access um, so we've got a mismatch between the culture of the gang and of the violence and the hate and what we offer, because most cultural participation is based on models of difference of a society that is not so extreme in its hate and its violence. Um, so one of the things we've got to learn is how but we can, an understanding of the sort of cultural features and characteristics of that which is so negative, how, and I suspect that's also true in the work that Daria and Alessandro is doing in terms of uh, the sort of cultures of hate and the hate agenda. And boy, have we lived through the hate agenda here in Brazil for the last four years. Um, and how we can learn from those mechanisms of hate, how we can learn new mechanisms of culture that can address it. Thank you for your, for your uh, reply, Paula. Um, do the other speakers uh, have uh, something else to add? Yes, Daria, please go ahead. So yeah, if I may, because um, thank you, Louise and Paul, for the super interesting presentation. Uh, and also adding on what Elisabetta and Paul were like saying now, I have several questions also to try to bridge these two contribution. So um, the first question is this one, are you, in a way, uh, maybe not in the research, but maybe you are doing it now, considering also the social capital fabric of each favelas, because like, for instance, if I have to consider what we find in our paper, if the favelas is endowed uh, with some level of, you know, social capital that react out of violence, uh, maybe producing cultural initiative or something different, Maybe this is gonna, you know, moderate the fear and push people to go out. And another thing that I would like to know is whether you are controlling for people that maybe uh, left the favelas because of this fear and the, the, the violence and the fears related to go elsewhere, find, you know, uh, more peaceful environment, because I mean, your um, findings are super interesting, but I mean, the, this sorting of people, I think should be considered to um, also understand all the dynamic that this violence can trigger. Maybe people stay at home and consume culture at home, but maybe other, other migrate because they want to, you know, have the social interaction of consuming cultural activity rather. So I would like to know if you are, have some Brilliant. thought about this. No, oh, yeah, it's so brilliant because one of the things that's the most you talked about the social fabric or social capital. And uh, one of the things we were looking at is measuring resilience factors. So what why? If 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 all these if all this terrible situation has happened, if they're living in a situation of warfare where the civilian deaths are greater than almost every other wars apart from the current one in Ukraine at the moment, how come they're not all mad? because we're looking at mental health, how they're not all completely destroyed by this. And one thing that is registered, as Louisa knows really well, is the factors of resilience. And those are incredibly high. I mean, just ridiculously high. I don't know what it's like in Italy, but just when I think about this in England, in England, 69% of respondents are satisfied with their friendships. 82% have a true friend. 80% are satisfied with their families. That's an amazing figure. 85% are satisfied with the people they live with. 71% are 
uh, practice of religion and 46% practice physical exercise. Those are incredibly high when compared with other using uh, uh, international instruments. How in other, so the social fabric, the social capital has incredible value. And actually, when asked, most of them don't want to leave the favelas. Their sense of belonging is incredibly strong. So that's one of the things we need to be looking, as Louisa has been indicating, the future avenues of research is not just the negative factors that are controlling cultural consumption, but actually what are the factors that are protecting them and whether we actually sort of outside the favelas are as good as that in actually maintaining a sense of belonging, well-being, and a social capital that works for us. Lucy, I don't know if you wanted to add to that, but. Now, just to add something about the question posed by Elisabetta, <clears throat> when we deal with cultural studies in general within social sciences domain, problem with the reverse causality is occur several times. And who cause who or what cause what is, is, is very, it's not very easy to demonstrate. Uh, here, uh, two different papers with two different data sources were presented. So for instance, in a panel with a panel data, we can measure the causality with a Granger uh, causality approach. That's my, my point, just to answer uh, your question, Elisabetta. Thank you very much. I thought it was really interesting when you and your paper were talking about the geo, geo uh, I can't remember the phrase you know, but the, the, the sort of geo markings of cultural consumption, because that was incredibly important to our, our study to be able to understand the distance people traveled, literally walking, or because there's, no, there's no public transport there, there's only motorbikes flashing all, all around all the time. So, how what's the relationship between the distance people traveled? both within the favela and outside the favela. So did they access cultural capital of the city of Rio, which is pretty strong, or and how much was that affecting? And of course, that you know, there's very little movement from the favela outside um, because of the fear, because of the lack of public transport to get to the main city. But there's in, there is intense movement within the favela, but it's very local. So this thing about cultural provision that Louisa was talking about is it's not enough to think about the supply side. So much more needs to be thought about in terms of how it operates. And the question about sport, well, that's a brilliant one, particularly for Brazil, of course. Um, yes, uh, we, we, we didn't include sport in this study. We have in other studies, but we did include physical activity. And it's not just sport, but also nutrition. Um, we've got a new study looking at um, elements of nutrition and cooking and the culture around um, exercise and cooking. And in fact, one of the things we did as a result of the research was to publish a, uh, a mental health guide. Mental health is not a headache. Um, that, come, that really takes the findings from the research and thinks about, well, what can people do uh, within their lives. And there we don't make any distinction between sport and culture. So even though our research did, I think when we actually start to think about strategies for people, we were much more plural. Thank you. I would like to collect a couple of questions or comments from the audience. Andre, do you have a question or comment? Thank you. A question. Um, it's a general Can, can we please see you? Uh, okay. Do you mind yeah. uh, switching on your camera? I apologize because I'm slightly ill. Uh, ah, I'm sorry. Uh, Please go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thanks. So, um, coffee club. So, the question is general and for all speakers. Um, most of the studies discussed causality. Um, Alessandro addressed this uh, in his um, comment a few minutes back uh, related to panels and creation causality. And the first study included uh, shift chair IVs. Are there any special issues related to causality uh, between? culture and hate that would need any special models related to causality in future. Our general econometric models using, um, I would say, IV and similar uh, uh, strategies sufficient, or would anything additional be needed based that culture and uh, hate are all very vague concepts, one would say, not very explicit. Thanks. 
Thank you, Andres. So who would like to answer to, to Andres' questions? So I can, possibly, I can see a few possibly things. Possibly in a concise way, so we can yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, collect yeah. another question before uh, ending. Yeah, so what we did in the paper was uh, an IV, panel IV, as you said, with shift share. Um, and of course, we have variables for spatial spillover of uh, cultural consumption uh, that, of course, you have to instrument also the spillover with the shift share. But I mean, it's a technique that you can uh, manage. The other thing we did, uh, we also consider a GMM as a robustness so that we can also include temporal lag together with spatial lag. Uh, and then again, then you use a different kind of IV, but I mean, these are the two main uh, uh, strategies I would suggest because you need to, I mean, focus on the mechanism you want to, to study. Uh, yeah. And I mean, you have a direct one and you consider spillovers as a further one. So you don't have to, I mean, you are, do not have to track your identification too much. Okay. So uh, in our case. Is, uh, okay, I'm sorry, please, please, sorry. No, please. sorry. Um, yep. Yeah, just to add that in our case, I think that uh, one of the improvements for future research would be to have a, um, panel da data on the variations of, of, of um, of human be of of individuals' perception of, of violence, or in in the in more um, a time series on the on the events of, of violence a long time, um, and the way that these would affect um, the way that these would affect affect human behavior. But in our case, we use some robustness checks as well, and uh, one of the methods that we use to uh, to make sure that it was not the other way around was to include also um, a variable indicating the fear that people had for other people around them, for relatives and family and uh, for and friends to uh, of being hit by a stray bullet. And with this, uh, we, could, we could make sure that uh, it wouldn't be uh, their own behaviors that would be affecting uh, this variable. So we tested the same model with including this variable instead, which is highly correlated with uh, the fear of being hit by a stray bullet and we included this val variable to test uh, if it could be also the other way around. And uh, all the robustness check, we did other re robustness checks as well. All the robustness checks that we did uh, also um, verified the, the, the finding. Okay, thank you. Just to add a, a little uh, a little consideration that I think that proximity effects could occur in, in, in cultural consumption, and so you know even if Daria has not agreed with me because she thinks that uh, is an aged uh, uh, method, I think that uh, Markovian chains could be useful. But again, we have to control with endogeneity and so on. Maybe we could go further in that direction. Mm -hmm. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, I think Stephen has uh, uh, another question or comment. Please go ahead. Um, yes, uh, this has been this is a fascinating uh, seminar, and bo both of these papers are so interesting. I, I just wanted to. I, I have really two a, a comment and a question that kind of relate to both. Um, first, something that Alessandra said about the looking at Granger causality uh, reminded me that with the uh, spatially identified cultural consumption and hate incidents that uh, uh, Daria and Alessandra are working with, you really have a panel time series structure your time series is a bit short, but still there might be enough to look at the extent to which these some types of cultural consumption and hate crimes are co-integrated. Uh, if panel co-integration is detected, it right away shows that uh, one Granger causes the other, or they may both mutually Granger cause. This also provides an econometric approach for dealing with some of the broader specification issues, which inevitably arise in these types of studies. One tries to control for things, but it's never possible to control for absolutely everything. And if you have uh, 
co-integrated time series and unit roots, then it's possible to estimate error correction models that will allow you to look at these things and it's robust to misspecification. So it's really a powerful econometric technique. The, the question or comment, I mean, what I loved about these papers is I kept thinking about that famous uh, quote by uh, Miguel de Unamuno that was uh, fascism is cured by reading and racism is cured by traveling. Um, and so the, the, the acknowledgement that some types of cultural consumption can combat hateful attitudes or, or hateful activities. Um, unfortunately, from what I understand from uh, Daria and Alessandra's analysis, they don't have data on reading. Um, and data on traveling is even more difficult to, to come by. So I'm not sure we're gonna be able to exactly test these theories, but in the second paper, the, the analysis of the favela violence, it did seem like there might be a possibility of looking at the power of different types of art forms. So one wonders, for instance, if you're able to look at or distinguish between the an artistic participation that is creative versus consumptive. So if I participate in a singing group or a choral group, I'm participating in the creation as opposed to going to a concert, I'm watching other people create. Or if I paint, I'm creating. If I go to a visual, to an art gallery, I'm looking at paintings that other people have done. Is there a difference between these types of cultural participation in terms of their restorative or, you know, hate mitigating e effects? So who would like to very briefly react to Stephen's uh, comments uh, in uh, one minute of, uh, for uh, each couple? Okay, well, the answer is yes um, <laughs> to the, the one that was addressed to us, Stephen. Uh, uh, one thing that was absolutely the center of what we were trying to do when we were, when we were constructing the surveys and the interviews. And one, one of the things that Louisa and her team were looking at was the difference of outside and inside, for example. What is the difference, not just uh, participation or consumption, but whether you did it in your house, or whether you did it out of your house, because of the social action that is, that is framed. But yes, uh, we uh, the production of culture, the involvement in the production of culture is, as we see across all of our research that we set up, is a much more dynamic, of course, engagement. But it, it's, it's not as, they're not as mutually exclusive. You know, for example, the poets we were working with, they produced a whole range of work, which then became ceramics with these phrases actually done like graffiti, but in ceramics on the wall, which are then read by the, by the residents because that's transformed a space and created a positive space in a very negative, de uh, de um, degraded space. So it's a chain of um, production and consumption rather than an, uh, an easy alternative between them. But thank you for the question because it's absolutely core to our work. Daria and Alessandro, would you like to add uh, uh, other remarks? You have also written something in the chat. Uh, would you like to oh. say something now? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so when yes. it comes to... Ah, Alessandro, go, go. No, 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 go ahead, Daria, please. Okay, so so super briefly. Um, okay, to do a population uh, scale study in which we can disentangle or considering consumption, production, co-production is kind of really difficult due to data availability. So uh, I don't think we can now do this with Italian data. Maybe something is possible with UK data because they also track uh, household level, spatially granular participation. Uh, even if I don't think that the time series is so long, but something that can happen. When it comes to your interesting point on the co-integration. So uh, we did something because of course it can be that um, 
culture is then influenced by uh, past hate, for instance, okay? So we adopted this approach uh, by Maida and Peri that has been recently published. They investigated something different. So the effect of migration or Republican voting in the US, okay? Uh, so what they did was to reverse the estimation, lagging past event or past. So what we did is was regressing current cultural consumption on a time series of, of past hate event to see if there was a significant association. We don't find it. So we can be, we can, I mean, be sure that there's not a huge threat of co-production, okay? Uh, as you said, the entire time series now is currently too short to do something more sophisticated than this. But I mean, it's a super good point. Thank you very much. Um, just a little answer. Mm -hmm. As I said before by Daria, uh, when we reduce the spatial unit of analysis, we, uh, we miss uh, data on, uh, <clears throat> because we know that cultural statistics are very uh, problematic. Uh, that's why we founded the Urban Cultural Observatory in L'Aquila with GSSIs. Um, trying to collect in data by moving from a survey in order to to catch some, for instance, some different effect of different cultural domains, because reading may have a different effect with respect to uh, theater or museum attending and so on. And of course, active cultural participation uh, shows in literature, mostly in medical literature, uh, higher effect in, the, in positive outcomes of, uh, of culture. That's all. Thank you so much. Uh, so I would like to thank greatly our four speakers uh, of, uh, of today, um, uh, Luisa Yachanna, Paul Heritage, Daria Denti, and Alessandro Crociata for their great presentations, uh, for the great insights they offered us today. Uh, so we have dealt with uh, the complex issue of uh, cultural part participation and how to define cultural participation and how to uh, design uh, uh, models uh, and dealing with the specification issues and uh, the issue also of uh, reverse uh, causality. Um, uh, there is great uh, avenue for uh, further research uh, empirically and also uh, theoretically. So we really look uh, forward uh, to your next uh, contributions. Uh, so stay tuned uh, uh, in our uh, outlets, the cultural, uh, the Journal of uh, Cultural Economics. And uh, talking about cultural economics, I would like to remind you that uh, the extended deadline in order for you to uh, contribute to the next biannual conference of cultural economics uh, that will take place in Bloomington uh, from the 27th to the, to the 30th of June this year in the USA. Uh, has been extended uh, uh, until the 26th of January. Uh, I put the link of the conference in the chat. Uh, so please feel free to contribute. It would be very nice to see uh, all of us uh, uh, to meet uh, for real in person in the US, uh, USA in, uh, in five months. So thank you so much. And I look forward to meeting you in uh, two weeks. Uh, we will deal with uh, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic and cultural participation. So once again, we will talk about effects. So stay tuned. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, great rest of the day, wherever you are. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Elisabetta. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Oh. Bye. Thank you.